Frank Ming, Josh Cohen, how are you, sir? Good, sir. Thanks for having me. <laughs> hey, it's my pleasure. I'm really, really happy to have you. Um, so uh, I'd like to start, Frank. Normally, I would kind of start with uh, the beginning, what, how you came to be you, how you came to have the, the thoughts, and you know how you traffic in the world now. I'm going to switch it up a little bit. Um, we okay. were just talking before we went on air here about the delightful year that we've had um, in every <laughs> respect. Uh, I want to start, if my notes are correct, Frank, uh, I believe you were arrested twice this year at BLM protests. Is that yes. true? Okay. It's true, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Frank. So um, if I'm not mistaken, I believe you and your son were shot with rubber bullets and tear gas as well. Yeah. <laughs> so just to kick us off, Frank, a uh, two-part question. What exactly happened there? And I'd like to know what are your thoughts on the, the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Yes, so my, my son came to visit me in Los Angeles um, the day that the protest started. And um, myself and my son are very both, both socially justice active. So um, we said, let's go down to the protest. And um, the first protest we got down, they, they, they bottlenecked us in like the cops did and then just unleashed like with tear gas and pepper. It was it was insane what that happened. Um, so I got my son out of there, of course. My, you know, I, my, he's, he's, he's 16 and he's a hockey player, so he's kind of a tough kid, but I still had to get him out of there. That's the, so um, I went back down later on the, the next day, and that was the day they put the curfew on us. And I was at this protest, and everything was going normal, and people started to disperse because the, the curfew was coming up, but they had trapped us all, all in. So you couldn't get out of the, the protest at all. No, there was no way you and they weren't anyone let any of us out. So wow. they closed us all in and beat the living crap out of us and then like arrested a bunch of us. Um, so I got arrested that time. Then um, I was with the, a couple of days later or about a week later, I was at another protest and it was up towards Beverly Hills and they the day before there was a really big ride up there. So they were really clamping down on stuff, but we were just doing a, a March protest and they came and said, no, no more protesting here in Beverly Hills. And, uh, they said, so disperse. And we're like, no way we're not, you know, it's our first amendment, right? We're doing this. Mm -hmm. and, and they, they arrested us all. Anyway, got out of that. Then I went down for a protest like three days later and this cop comes over because, because now some of the, the, um, BLM people were asking me to like say things like I was like this one white person they were like here you get because I was I was going up there and telling a little bit of my story but also saying like how much this really matters to me that this is that Breonna Taylor matters to me mm -hmm. um, so that day again um, just uh, the cops pulled in man and they started shooting us with rubber bullets and I fell over this girl man and these cops just were just unloading on us like just hitting us and beat it was it was it was insane it was yeah. absolutely insane um so why i'm so active uh let me go back just a little bit for you um when i got out of the neo-nazis in 1994 i just tried to walk away from that life and i went back to my old neighborhood in south philly and just kind of did what people did in my neighborhood but for about a year i just tried to hide that i was used to be a neo-nazi even though i had a big swastika still on my neck at the time this is 1994 um, so for about a year or about eight months, I'm just trying to hide who I was. I'm just trying to integrate back into my old neighborhood. And, uh, the Oklahoma city bombing happened. Mm -hmm. And there's this picture of this fireman running down the street with this dead little girl in his arms. And that picture, man, just kept killing me and killing me. And I, every time we watched the news, now all my friends in South Philly, they all knew cause I came back to South Philly with a big swastika on my neck. I got prison. I got a prison number tattooed on me. I've been down, um, I've been all over the country for the neo-Nazis in the last like five years that I left my neighborhood. So when I came back, all my friends were like, they knew I went somewhere, but they, I never went into detail. I never sat around and told stories about being with the neo-Nazis, none of that shit. When the Oklahoma City bombing happened and I seen that picture of that dead little girl, I turned to some of my friends who were my lifelong friends that I grew up with in my neighborhood now. And I said, guys, I might know who did this. And uh, what's really shocking is when I tell that story, because I think about how they now have all retold that story to people and how I hear that story now from people. Mm. Like, that was very shocking to people. And, and to know that really, I truly was a wannabe Timothy McVeigh. So um, that picture made me become an activist against the neo-Nazis. And, 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 I, and I went to the FBI and I, and I started speaking out and you know, so forth. Um, when this pandemic hit, 
I've been going through a huge life change. I just went through a divorce. Mm. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's been going on in my life. My, my oldest son died in a car accident. Oh, sorry just, to hear that. Yeah, just thank you. I'm just coming through a lot of stuff in my life. And, and I moved to Los Angeles and uh, the pandemic hit, man. And, and I knew that this was a time for me that I could be like everyone else and, and play video games and, and get this repair. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Like, I want to get real, real serious about, for one, my sobriety mm-hmm. and also my connection with God. And when I, that pandemic hit, man, I just cocooned myself in and just studied and learned and, and really learned about how to get closer to God by, by taking a dozen steps closer to God. And, and, and I just got with some spiritual advisors. And then Breonna Taylor gets killed. Now, Breonna Taylor got killed way before George Floyd. She was the right. first. She was before Ben uh, um, um, yeah, Arbery. She was before him. Um, and, and I had heard of her case. And it, I'd already... For years, by the grace of God, I've always been studying Fourth Amendment issues because it's just been something I, I didn't like the way that I knew that there was a lot of racist cops because of my old background. And uh, I've been starting to really study about how the Fourth Amendment is something that the police tread all over, especially using the war on drugs, especially to our and Frank, Frank, I, I apologize to jump in, but just for the clarity of our audience, um, what is that Fourth Amendment, sir? I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, good point. No problem. No, no. So the Fourth Amendment is the rights of search and seizure, and it was written by John Jay and and um, Madison. Hamilton also was part of it, but they, he's not an author of the Fourth Amendment, but he's totally involved in the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment, um, you got to remember, the Third Amendment is something that people don't really talk about. It's kind of a weird one. It's that we won't allow soldiers to use our homes for forts, forts, forts anymore. That's the Third Amendment. But that was kind of just like an F you to England when they wrote that one. That was like an ultimate, like, you know, we ain't right. ever doing this stuff. Again. But the Fourth Amendment was set up to protect us from the government that we were even making of search and seizures, meaning they had, we need a proper warrant. See, and what they've done over the years, the police, um, and since the early 90s, they've really started doing this, is, um, you know, wanting to search our cars by using dogs, by, you, you know, they, they, their goal when they pull so many different people over is just to search your car. So we got to know that they're trained for weeks on end on how to violate our Fourth Amendment. And it has started to break policing over the years. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, because you think about it, suburban cops, when they see black people come through from the cities, what's the one thing they want to do? They don't just pull them over to get, they want to search their car. Hmm. And it has broken, the, it has seriously broken. That training to do this has broken the Fourth Amendment, which has made them more than our civil servants to us anymore, right? Because once you break an amendment, once you break something in this Constitution that we've made the Bill of Rights, you move above the rest of us. And they've done that. And it has broken because when they started to do the more Fourth Amendment violations, our mass incarceration shot up. Mm-hmm. The same years, it is like a stamp. It says, look. Because in 1998, they also got some other rulings against us that were, made them that they were allowed to pull us all out of cars. It's a whole, that was, the, I think, the MIMS case. Don't, um, it's definitely 1998 was the case. And um, it made it to where the police were now allowed to order everybody out of a car. And, and it, it, they say it's all for officer safety. And I want to tell you, before we get back to Brianna Taylor, who is very important in this story, but, um, like, it's not about officer safety. It's about them controlling the situation. I, I promise you, I've worked with police for 25 years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about them controlling the situation, not so safety. Because if they stopped searching our cars and breaking our Fourth Amendment, people won't be so angry to them. So if a guy has maybe a quarter ounce of cocaine in his car and he doesn't want to go back to the mass incarceration system, or he just doesn't want to get bu- pulled out of his car and searched and bullied, he's not going to shoot it out with the cops. If the cop just pulls you over and gives you a ticket like they're supposed to, to be our civil servants, not be our masters and overlords and say, let us check your stuff. Right. It's ridiculous that we live in a country like that. Like, and they've changed the rules on us. So I've been following that for a long time. I've been very uh, – while I was coaching hockey, which is getting into my other story, it's <laughs> like I coached hockey for a long time. But I used to break down hockey footage on my computer all day. That's what I did. I watched hockey games and I broke down the footage. But when I would get tired and bored of that, I would go over to police videos, police pullover videos. And for hours, dude, I would spend hours watching these videos and breaking them down. And um, so I just know that the solution for us to correct and fix policing is in the training of 
training them civil servants to want to search our cars. It has broken the whole system. I prom- like it's so weird if we really look into it. It has really taken cops who are already a little bit arrogant, a little bit fearful, and it trains them to be more arrogant, more fearful to us when they come to our traffic stops. And then remember that their mindset is, mm-hmm. I want to search this car because I think you're a criminal. They don't search your car for no other reason. They don't want to see if you're just okay. Presumption of guilt. Your clean. They want to get a case against you. Hmm. That And we have 2.4 million people in prison, far more than any country on planet Earth. By far, I mean, we have 4% of the world population, but 27% of the world prison population. Like, the land that are free, are you kidding me? And it all goes back to these trainings of the officers to want to search our stuff and break our Fourth Amendment. So, been really into that for a long time. As I said, I've cocooned in. Uh, I'm really trying to get right with God, and, 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 I, and I feel that I have. Um, I've, mm-hmm. For today, I understand better how to service, be of service to God. But it, it, when I've seen the Brianna Taylor thing, that woke up that same activism in me that that little girl did in the Oklahoma City bombing. She like it was just the note that them cops shot through a glass door with a screen in front. They couldn't even see in there. They just shot through there while she was sleeping. Really, well, yeah, well, they have no regard for people's lives when it comes to the cops, especially to our black and brown brothers and sisters. So I, I've been a big activist of that for a long time. I was a person in years ago used was on CNN and other things where they would talk to me about racism because some neo-Nazi guy said the N-word again. And I'd be like, great, but you want to talk about real racism? Let's talk about the stop and frisk. Mm-hmm. And then CNN be like, oh, well, and I'm like, no, that's the real issue of racism. Not this, I don't... As a former neo-Nazi, I don't worry because I used to do interventions on all of them, the guys getting them out. But right now, that's not the most important thing is the guy saying the N-word. Right now, we need to control what's real racism in America. And that is... Reform. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That is... Too many white people in this... White America has gotten to the life raft of America and we pulled the ladders out of the water. We pulled the ladders out. So other people... And that's kind of like the suburbs. That's the that's the that's the life raft of America, and how do they keep the ladders pulled up? The guard, the cops guard them ladders, and this movement at this time where our country and our movement is going, we're moving them cops and we're pushing them ladders back down in, getting everybody in these boat, you know? Yeah, man. No, I look, I, I really appreciate your answer on that. Um, yeah. In in that vein, oh, I'm sorry. Was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Otherwise, I wanted to go, bring it back. Um, let's go. Perfect. It's your show. Let's do your show. <laughs> I have very little power in the world, but I have this much, right? At least. I got you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I want to begin, as we dial the clock back, um, how we define the term white supremacist. You know, And the, the reason, it may sound like a dumb question to our audience, but the reason is I always like to separate out the terms white supremacist versus white separatist, right? They're not, in my view, they're not necessarily the same. I'll give you all the time to correct me on that. Yeah, I got you. I <laughs> yeah. got you. Yeah, so I'm going to start off. Uh, how do you define uh, white supremacy? And would you categorize, you know, the Klan, neo Nazis, the the usual suspects as white supremacists? I mean, yeah, yes, they're all white supremacists. They all believe. I'll break it down real quick. Here's here's what makes a white supremacist. Yes, a person who believes because of the color of their skin they are better than another human being. Even though they've done nothing in this world to accomplish this, right? Their parents just happen to be the same color and happen to have sex. And now they are that color. So because of that, they are superior to others. It's a very lazy movement. Think about it. You didn't have to achieve anything. You don't have to go out and be a good humanitarian. You don't have to go out and get a degree. You're just born with this color skin and now you're better than everybody else. It's a very lazy movement belief process. So that's who anyone that believes that because of the color of their skin that they are white supremacists or they are, they're, they're superior to others because of the color of their skin. Mm. But then again, we have the, the white supremacy I would also identify as in policing and our judicial system. So there's a levels. And, and like I said, right now, we're dealing with all levels at this time in, in history. Sure. So, but the white supremacist is, is that, but white nationalists, I mean, they're the same thing. They, they want to be their own country because they feel they're better than everyone else. So they are technically white supremacists. You know, anyone that believes because of the color of their skin, they are better than another human being, than another one of God's children at mm-hmm. that. You know, you're better than God's children, yeah, because of the color of your skin. Like, So um, that that they all kind of bunch in together once it comes to that. That's kind of the basic feel of what they think. And uh, But the truth is that they're 
all just very fearful, mostly men, very fearful men. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Fear, fear everything, you know, they fear the Jews, they fear, uh, you know, the Mexicans are coming, they fear gays, they fear that it's, it's all, look, just watch Fox News. It's all fear of taking Christmas away, fear they're doing this, you know, it's always fear that people are going to take what's theirs. Right. So. Huh, interesting. No, thanks, Frank. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, I definitely want to get a sense of, obviously, your upbringing, Frank, and what what in your early childhood guided you to the movement. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, so I grew up in South Philadelphia in a real tough Irish Catholic neighborhood. Um, we had neighborhood racism back then. It's Again, I'm not justifying it. I'm just trying to explain it as a, a layman's term is, you know, like we had, we hated the, the black kids from the other neighborhood and we hated the Puerto Rican kids from the other neighborhood and we hated the Italians and we hated the Polish. We, you know, we, if you didn't grow up in our Irish Catholic neighborhood, we didn't like you. And all the other neighborhoods felt the same way. It's just the way it was, right? It was not safe to go into their neighborhoods. Like it, it, none of them, like I, I was an Irish kid even though I'm half Irish, half Italian, I can kind of get away with it. But we didn't go up into the Italian neighborhood, even though they're white. You know, it just so we just grew up that way. Um, my mom and I, uh, it was, she was a single mom. My dad was Italian and he lived in a different neighborhood and a whole big mess with that. I never really see the guy. And my mom got remarried. And, and, and me, before she got remarried, you know, we were on welfare at times when I was a kid, you know, we used to get food stamps and a little booklet, not, not, the, not the card. They used to give us a neon, they used to give us a booklet of money, it was fake money called food stamps, food coupons. Hmm. And you used to put them out of the book and you had to give them to the cashier and it was welfare. And um, my mom would give me that booklet, man, and say, hey, go to the store, go get this, this, and this. And I'd be like, please, mom, give me real money. Please don't make me go to the store with the people, you know, with the poor people food, you know? And and because when you're at a corner deli in South Philly where everyone knows your business, man, we are all like second and third cousins from each other. I mean, literally, we are all off the boat from each other, right? So everyone knows your business, man. And, and uh, you go into the store and you pull out them food stamps, man, and every time the hottest girl in the neighborhood come walking in the store, you know, you can't stop food. You know, you're not buying, buying with food stamps, you know. So, uh, um, and, and literally, I mean, and I just want to say this again, like, yeah. I, I remember I would go to my grandma, and then my grandma was very Catholic. Um, I'm no longer Catholic, but I still love the, the upbringing that it gave to me. Um, but, my, you know, my grandma was very Catholic and very involved with the church, and I remember I would go to my grandma and be like, this is to tell you how close we all were. I'd be like, hey, grandma, I like Susie Q. She'd say, Susie Q from 4th Street? Yeah. Susie Q from 4th Street. Susie Q from 4th Street. She'd go, that's your third cousin from the boot. <laughs> says, bastard, don't touch her, you got to. <laughs> <laughs> like, Damn, I can't, I can't date out the neighborhood. You can't date in the neighborhoods. We're all related. And it was tough. It was tough, man. So anyway, uh, my mom gets remarried to a guy who who is uh, just a, an abusive man. Just uh, again, he's a child of God too, and I kind of gotta I forgive him for what he's done to me. But it was yes. just nothing nice, man. It was just nothing nice. And the, the, I'll sum it all for you this way: as a uh, from a, an eight to a thirteen year old kid, I used to, have to go to school, you know, and I have to walk to school. And when my stepdad lived with us for them years. Every almost every day, man, I I plan I plan on getting hit by a car. Like I, I was like, I'd rather get hit by a car than go home. And 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 I knew that getting hit by a car, like it wasn't gonna kill me. It wasn't like a death sentence here. I figured if I hit, jump in front of the right car, it'll hit me. I'll go to the hospital. I don't have to go home. Mm. I just didn't want to go home. And and I, and I would never I, for my whole life. And I, I say this because I'm gonna curse myself. My whole life, I want to get hit by a car. When I was, I still never been hit by a car. And everyone in my neighborhood gets hit by cars because we live in that little small, narrow street neighborhoods where it's always your cousin that runs you over. You can't even sue him. <laughs> like you can't do anything, right? So that's how I was raised, man. And, wow. and I, I hated that life. And, and I, uh, I hated going home. And I hated my stepfather. And it, it was just nothing nice. And uh, my mom did the best she could, right? Now, so I, my mom is passed on from a heroin overdose. But um, uh, just drugs and alcohol, hardcore. My mom kicks me out. I move in with my dad. My dad lives up in um, 
different part of Philly in a rough, rough neighborhood, like Southwest, West Philly. It's Fresh Prince was up in that area. If you remember <laughs> the song, West Philly, born and raised. On the, like, my dad was up in that neighborhood. And so Will Smith, his, his black butt got to move out of that neighborhood. My white butt moved into that neighborhood. And I was a, a my way minority. I, I went to an all-black school called Pepper Middle School. My dad has a bar, and he has nothing to do with my life. He just lives in this little tavern bar where they sell fucking coke and every weed and everything else out of that bar and my dad just hung in that bar and it was all roofers it was the craziest little ghetto bar man in this rough neighborhood and my dad just i just lived in that bar grew up in that bar wow. and uh anyway i was starting on this all black school man and these black kids i was new i came in the middle of the school year i was kind of a punk rock skater i'm an athlete i'm like on every team in that in the school and black is just hate and they did, there was a group of them that was in my same age group that I was, again, just a new kid. It's not just because they were black. It's just what happens in middle school. But to me, my world is crumbling. My, my mom just kicked me out. My stepdad said he doesn't want me no more, and he's going to make my mom make sure that you don't want me no more. And then he gets me kicked out. No lie. He told me he's going to do it, and he did it. Then I live with my dad who doesn't give a shit. Right? And then I go to school, and these black kids all want to fight me all the time. And I'm like, what? Like, I can't get out of this. But none of them black kids could beat me as much as my stepdad did. So it was never a much, you know... Um, but it was just rough, man. It was rough going to that school. And that was where my fear, because I, I was full of fear, full of fear all the time. That was where when I went to that school and I knew I was kind of on my own, my dad ain't going to help. I, my fear turned to hate that year. And it just happened to be the black kids, you know. Um, I get it. You know what I mean? Like they, they were causing me harm. I'm, I'm, I'm a 13-year-old kid. Right. Whose life, I mean, so... That summer, I got to go up to go live with my my step. I mean, with my cousins in the in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area, and they were on my mom's side. They originally were living in South Philly. And my uncle up and rooted the kids and just moved out to the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area. That's like Amish people, and they really live. Very, look, I'm a city kid. Never been out of the city in my life, except for to go to South Jersey. That's where we go. Wildwood, New Jersey, and South Philly. That's my whole life when I was growing up. So I never went anywhere else. And now my uncle moves the kids up there and he starts bringing me up there to keep them company because they were my cousins and they didn't have any friends. And there's in South Philly, everyone lives right around the corner, literally mm. everyone lives right around the corner. In Amish country, there's a, a five mile long road and there's four houses on it. And the other three were Amish people. So like, you know, like there wasn't normal people around. And <laughs> um, right? like, I'm not trying to. Like, no, no. I like those people really turn butter they sat on their porches and turned butter like they're not reenacting it for you like oh my god here comes josh let's reenact that turning butter and riding horse and buggies they've really lived that fucking way dude are you kidding me <laughs> and my cousin lives in that neighborhood man and I, I, I up in that neighborhood up in this part of the town and so i go up there for the summer to go spend the summer with him because he's still pissed off that his dad moved him out of there from the city and he became a punk rock skateboarder kid <laughs> and i became a punk rock skateboarder kid earlier in that, the year earlier when i visited him the summer earlier and now I go up to go visit him again, and he's into this neo-Nazi thing. And my aunt and uncle, who are great people, so I don't want people to think they were, but they, they thought he was just going through a phase because he's been so angry about the move up to Lancaster and out of the, from the, from all of his cousins. Now he goes up with Amish people, and they're not Amish, and they have electricity. And so they just let him go through his little phases. And this time, though, I get there, and he has, like, all these articles about neo-Nazis and skinheads, like wallpaper to his wall. And my aunt and uncle just let him get away with it. He was, 50, he was 15 going on 16, and, uh, and I'm 13 going on 14. And I go up into his room, and he's got like a swastika flag, and he's got a thing of Hitler, and they're always watching videos about neo-Nazis and skinheads and back on VCR tapes, you know. And uh, the Geraldo fight was a big thing when they broke Geraldo's nose on the talk show. Yeah. You know, all that was happening at that time. And, and so my cousin's... I mean, this is like that fight happened and I'm like becoming a neo-Nazi at the time. Um, so my cousin anyway says to me, um, when he comes in the room and we start talking and he's explaining a little bit about what he's about and about how he's for the white race and all right, cool. And oh, I, you know, that, I get it. Then every night these other skinheads would always come over. They always came to my cousin's house and hung out. That was like the hangout house. My aunt and uncle, did, again, they just kind of let him be and let him do his thing. And they would go on the opposite side of 
of the farmhouse. So we had a room and, and all these neo-Nazis would come over and they'd come drinking. And they're like 16, 17 year old guys. So these aren't like stormtroopers here. These are like 16, 17 year old farm boys that are now shaved heads and have swastika tattoos. And they would come over there and they start drinking and they started talking to me because they would talk about black people, but I could tell like they had no idea what they were talking about, right? Because they didn't live around black people. Sure. So, um, so my cousin would say to them, yo, my little cousin right here, he, he, he knows what it's like to be around black people. My, you know, he starts telling about how bad my, na- my dad's neighbor is. So all these neo-Nazis would always want to talk to me all the time, you know, because they're just like, what's it really like kind of, you know, like, and, and there was this one girl one time who would question me. She's like, you're going to tell me you take the bus with black people? I was like, yeah, yeah, chick. I, 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 I live in West Philly. Like I have to take the L train. Yes. Like every day I see black people, right? Kind of. And it's funny that you think that that'd be weird for her to ask me that, but let's switch it up. Imagine if I sat her down and stood above her and said, so you're going to tell me you see Amish people every day? Hmm. You know, Cause that's what she's seen. Right? Sure. So these skinheads always asking me about what's it like being around black people. It's simple enough as it was someone asking me, how's my day? Both my parents didn't give a rat's ass about me. They just didn't. And it's just that they were both into their drugs and alcohol in their own lives. And I was a mistake that came along through two thugs, you know, my mom, my, my dad, just a Rocky Bubba, a drug dealing, badass guy. And, um, I, no one ever asked me how, how I was doing. And when these neo-Nazis would say, what's it like living around black people? It was someone saying, how are you doing? Mm. And I like that. You know what I mean? I just liked hanging around them. They gave me some attention. You felt seen. Yeah, absolutely. Heard. I felt heard. I felt seen. I felt like I had, like I mattered. Mm. Like I mattered. Somehow, some way, I finally mattered. And so all these neo-Nazis would always go up to like these nightclubs. and, And I start going with them. And I still have a little teardrop haircut, you know, and uh, all these neo-Nazis were going to go in and at the time they were going up and beating other white people because they're going to nightclubs in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So they're not going into the city here, right? Right, they're right. Go with them, and they're fighting with other white people. And at the other time, at the time, this is 1988 going into 89, you got to remember the other big white hairstyle was the mullet. <laughs> so that's kind of a good cause to be against the mullet, right? You know what I mean? Like everyone's down, right? We, we'll build some alliances here, right? <laughs> I'd forgive it. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Holocaust, small cause, they have a mullet, right? You're like, little oh, column A, little yeah. column B. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, that's so, funny. Um, anyhow, man, um, when these guys would let me hang out with them at these nightclubs, everyone was scared of them. Everyone feared them. And, and I, I remember like going up to people, and people would just be like, yo, we have no problem with you guys. And I, again, I'm not shaved bald yet. I'm still the little skateboarder punk rock kid hanging out with the big neo-Nazis. And I felt so good. I felt so strong. I felt so powerful. Like people were actually, I could see the look of fear in people's eyes. And I loved it. Hmm. I loved it. I mean, up until that point in my life, I might be a 14-year-old athletic, tough kid, as people would say. But really, I was a scared seven-year-old boy. Sure. I feared everything, man. I feared my parents. I feared my step-parents. I feared my school. I feared if I was going to have enough fucking food to eat today. Now someone fears me? Bet, man, it's on. I like these guys. It's it's one of those things. You know, everyone knows that um, if you dig into the psychology of someone that's a bully, they're, they've always been bullied themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. You, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. You ask. You ask. Sure, show. We're too polite. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I uh, I definitely had this that I, I wanted to ask you. I, I'd like to um, ask you when you actually made the decision to have a swastika tattooed on your neck. Yeah, it was one of my bright 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 moments in my life. Like, <laughs> you know, a real real light bulb went off in my head on this one. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, right after, so when I, they asked me to join right after that night at the, at the nightclub, like the guys were like, hey, we shaved your head. And I said, absolutely. And I became part of it. The move right up until I, I got so involved in this, man. I, I, I got rid of everything. I didn't talk to my family no more. I didn't go to high school. I didn't go to school. I'm in eighth grade. I, I went to eighth grade and that's it. That's all I got my whole life. I, I, I went to a couple uh, high schools for two, three minutes. And it wasn't, didn't, didn't match well. So I moved in with the movement, become part of the movement. 
don't move in with my parents, don't move back with my parents. Um, my dedication to this thing became everything. It became my team, right? I was always a team guy. I was always a sports guy. I grew up playing football. I was a really good ranked football player as a kid growing up. Um, a very quick little white wide receiver, like Wes Welker or something, you know? That's, that's who I was. Um, kickball, kickoff return specialist, all that type of stuff. Um, when these guys accepted me on this team, and they used to bring me up to Bible studies, and they would teach me about how, all right, so we would go shoot guns, and then we'd go back to someone's place in Pennsylvania out in the woods, and they'd have a military tent set up. And we go in there and we learn that shooting guns and preparing for a race war is is our job from God. Now, I was born and raised Irish Catholic, mm -hmm. so I, I know God. I know a concept of what it is. And, and so when these guys would start to preach the book, they'd say, man, Adam and Eve, you know the first story. And you're like, yeah, you know. God said, don't eat the fruit. The chick does it anyway and then tricks the dude into doing it because we do whatever they tell us to do. That's what happened. That's when now we're all in bad trouble because of that, right? That's not their. That's not how. That's not their version. I'll wait for you hear their version. It's a good one. So the serpent that comes up to Eve to partake of this fruit isn't saying, take. You know, he he he's actually enticing her to have sex with him. That's the, that's the knowledge with the okay? snake. With the snake, he's a serpent man because he's a demon. He's a, he's the devil. So he's like a man. He's a serpent. It says he's a serpent man. Okay, so they're saying the serpent man comes to the, the Eve and he tricks her to have sex with him, and he impregnates her with Cain, and then she hurry up and knows she did something wrong. So that's where she goes and runs to Adam and says, "You got to partake in this too," meaning have sex with her, so that she can trick him to think that this baby that she knows she's been impregnated with by this devil is going to trick him and say, "This is your baby." This is true. This is what they believe. Not it isn't true. It's true. This is what they believe. Sure. Um, so mm -hmm. now when uh, so now Adam and Eve have sex and and God comes and um, when Cain is born, the first child, he later on kills Abel, who is Adam and Eve's first real child, because Cain is by the devil. Now, just so you know, in the the Bible already, we have the first Mori Povich episode going on here. We don't know <laughs> whose babies was, where's DNA test. We don't know. <laughs> But this is their version. This is their version. And so that Cain kills Abel later on. Cain is the first evil Jew on the planet. And that's why he's marked. Right? Um, marked with the nose, the horns, the whole, you know, the, the ears, the whole thing. Right? Hmm. So that Cain is the first evil Jew on the planet. And just to back up the, the story, if you ever look in any of their research or any of their stories, which I'm sure you would just be on there for research, not for educational. Hmm. Um, it will always say stuff like the devils are the seed of Satan. The devils, I mean, the Jews are the seed of Satan. The Jews are the seed of, like, oh, they say that all the time. Jews are the seed of Satan. It goes back to that story. The king. Hmm. Okay. That's what they're referencing. That's extraordinary. That's what they're referencing. That's it. You're the, you're the son of the devil. So, um, so they would teach us that type of stuff and then learn. And I go out there and I would remember, I would question things and say like, dude, I never, like I went to I went to catechism. I made all my sacraments as a Catholic. I went to you know I went to church whenever I could lie and not go to church. Uh, you know I was a good Catholic boy. I went to confession. Um, I would say, you know, Sister Sister Mary Agnes and Father Wassel never taught me this story. I never heard this at mass before about the devil having sex with Eve. You know, so when I would say that to them, I'm like, Yo, Father Wassel, Sister Mary Agnes never taught me this stuff. They say because God has chose you to know it now. Hmm. He needs hmm. angels to ruin Sodom and Gomorrah. He needs you, Frank. You are like an angel to him, and you're going to ruin Sodom and Gomorrah for him. Yo, to tell me that God wants this welfare kid from Philadelphia it is is it's what how they build it's how they build uh, Islamic extremists. It's the same tactic, you know. And 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 sure, they're not communicating with each other. It's just a way to work on someone to give them purpose. Sure. So. So, man, that leading into all that is like one night where I would just decide a swastika is going on my neck and a portrait of Joseph Goebbels. And I mean, I just at 15, I was getting Nazi tattoos everywhere on me. I had Sig Heil written I, in the back of my head. I've seen some of the old photos. You look like a canvas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, that, so that's when I made that decision to get those type of tattoos. Wow. So I um, no, Thank you, Frank. Uh, just for our audience, uh, I'm going to ask a slightly uncomfortable question. And Frank gave me permission that. Everything no holds barred, right? 
<laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks, man. Yeah. So uh, I know way back in the day you hosted a, a public access show called The Reich. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you were something like a celebrity in neo-Nazi circles, right? Um, a little bit. So I'd like to know what was it that happened on uh, Christmas Eve and what was the aftermath? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not too bad. I can talk about that. Um, mm. So Christmas Eve 1992, we um, call up a, uh, uh, basically an Antifa member that lived in this town where I was living in Springfield. Now I have the TV show and I'm getting a lot of press and yeah, a little bit of celebrityness, I guess. I, I, I don't want to talk about it. Like it was great when it was promoting something so evil. So I don't want to say, you know, I'm just trying not to sound like it, but I was, people no, didn't know no, about me. Okay? Notorious. Maybe, let's yeah, say. There you go. That, yeah, I guess that's scary too. <laughs> but anyway, um, we called up this Antifa member, which was actually a gang called the Sharps, S H A R P skinheads against racial prejudice. And they're basically an Antifa. It's a, they're part of Antifa, but back then we just called them Sharps. And, um, so we called this guy up and he came over on Christmas Eve and, um, there was no Christmas party. We had lied to him and told him it was a Christmas party. And he came over and we kidnapped him. And uh, we tortured and held this man for for, for hours. And, um, yeah, we uh, we tried to get money for him. We tried to help do the ransom thing. And nobody would pay the ransom. And we never, I never got stuck with that situation before, <laughs> you know? Yeah. It wasn't. It's just, you know, and so, um, you know, there's kind of some rules, you know, like two hours into a kidnapping or a ransom dispute, you, um, you have two hours to get the money. And then, uh, after, if you don't get that, then you have to make a dramatic, usually drop the money, drop the price, whatever it might be. Um, and, uh, this just wasn't going well. So, uh. Christmas morning, we decide, you know, you have to make that decision, you know, you got this guy captive, you know, you know, off him or let him go or cut off a finger and make sure people think you're serious. I don't know. You know, I'm not, I wasn't a mentally right person at that time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we decide to let him go. And on Christmas day, he goes and goes right to the hospital because he had to get stitches in his face and in his head from some of the torturing and stuff. So, um, so he uh, went to the police, and you know the police couldn't wait to catch me, man. I was I was uh, bad news, man, hmm. real bad news, and they knew it. I could try to do this thing that I was off from. The cops hated me because I was using my First Amendment right to, you know, because I had the TV show. I was trying to yell all this stuff. The police just against me because my First Amendment right. And no, nah, man, I was no good. I, I mean, I I was an egomaniac with no self-esteem who was adamantly violent and, and an alcoholic at the time. At 17, 16, already active alcohol. Wow. Um, they know I'm not from Springfield, Illinois at the time, because uh, just so you guys know, I still have it to this day. On top of my head, I have a tattoo up here. It's in my hairline. It's hard to see, but I do really have it. It says Made in Philly. <laughs> so <laughs> they, know I'm, they know I'm not a local, right? <laughs> it says it on my head. <laughs> so they, 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 get the, uh, they get this kid and... He wasn't a kid. He was he was a 19-year-old man. And I, I was 17, so I don't want people to think I was kidnapping a child here. This guy was actually older than I mean, He was the head of another gang, so he's part of the game for me at the time. Still not justifying what I'd done. I'm just giving people the structure reasons and why it's happening, yeah. Um, so uh, the police arrest me at the next taping of my TV show. And they, uh, they arrested me and they charged me as an adult for aggravated kidnapping and unlawful restraint. Uh, they had a burglary charge on there, which later got dropped because I, I didn't do a burglary. But they had a burglary. I mean, they had a whole whack of charges on me, man. And uh, that's when I found out they were going to charge me as an adult. And uh, this is where the whole American History X thing kind of kicks in that everyone talks about. So Yeah, I, I, I'm sad to say I do have a little time set aside for that. <laughs> Can't not ask yeah, a question about it, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thanks, Frank. And uh, I believe you went to jail for three years. Is that correct? Three year sentence. Uh, I did a little, a year and some change. So okay. a three year sentence. Understood. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I'm curious. Uh, do you do you have a first moment um, where doubt about what your current worldview was started to creep in? 
Uh, no, no. I mean, there was a couple moments, man. Like the day that, so I got sentenced and I got put on the big bus to go upstate. And what's crazy is like one of the first prisons I get transferred to has John Wayne Gacy at it. I don't know if you know him. Mad. Uh, the guy that killed, no, he killed, uh, John Wayne Gacy killed, yes, yeah, the clown killer. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 34, 34 men that they know of. My age, 16, 17 year old boys. As I'm 17 going into prison in this adult maximum security prison. I'm a wow. kid. And um, got the swastika on the neck, you know. And uh, I remember that being a moment where I, when I got off that bus where I wasn't worried about him, okay, because I'm, I'm, I'm already well protected. Everyone knows who I am. All the gangs got my back. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to talk like I was a big deal, but people were excited to protect me because of the TV show. So when I got in there, like bikers and all my, you know, the Aryan guys were always, like, it was an honor for them. They'd be talking, like, they loved protecting me. They thought it was a cool job to have, right? And I just did whatever I wanted. I mean, I was young, 17 year old, high ranking member of this, not, I was an Aryan Brotherhood, I was in the Aryan Nations part, which, but we all run together in there. Um, that was Strike Force, I, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in there. No, Strike Force was a gang I was in in Philly, but once I got to the Illinois, um, the, the gangs in prison are, are bikers, it's a biker gang, which is the bigger, the biggest white gang of all. And then there's little splinters of like Aryan Brotherhood, Aryan Nations, all these little splinter gangs off the, what they call the biker gang. And, and so I'm in with the biker gang because my Aryans run with the biker gang. So, I mean, I'm in with the biggest bikers and they were like, you know, they were always like, you had your own TV show. And I'm like, yeah. And, you know, so they thought it was cool. And they thought I was brilliant. They thought I was like, like one of the smartest racists they ever met. Cause I would talk, I could talk against the Jews. I could bring, you know, they just hated black people cause they're in prison with them. You know, they hate the Mexicans, right, right. you know what I mean? And I'm in there and I'm like, nah, dude, it's biblical, blah, blah, blah. You know, and they were like, man, <laughs> she already knows something. So, um, so um, that, that was a r real waking moment. And then like, I, I, I'll tell you, there was just times, man, where I, one of the kids I was in county jail with, this black kid, who, and when you're in a county jail, you get cool with everyone. There's no gang alliances in the county jail. Like, everyone's just waiting their trial, right? And then you're getting waiting to either get released or get sent upstate. So everyone's just, like, sitting in there not trying to cause trouble. And me and this one black kid, he taught me how to play spades, and he taught me how to play dominoes, and he taught me how to cheat. And so me and him were cool in county jail. Well, he winds up coming up to the same state penitentiary I'm in a couple months later. Like, his trial wasn't the same time as mine. Like, we were on at different times. And so with that being said, uh, when he came up and we would always hang out and, and play cards and I played football with him, I played basketball with him and it's the American history X stuff that they kind of refer to. Sure. And I did, I played sports with all them guys and I'm a really good athlete and, and the Aryan brotherhood and the Aryan nation guys were never mad because they knew I was like a really good athlete because I played sports with them and always blew by them in any sport we played. Like it was not fun playing basketball with a bunch of bikers from central, <laughs> central Illinois, right? It's like Chris Rock said, you got to let double dribbling go. You got to let traveling go because they don't <laughs> give a shit, right? So... Uh, but I knew how to play the game and it, that type of stuff really bothers me. And I'm like, come on, that's traveling. Come on, dude. And they don't know. They're bikers with big, long beards. They can't dribble the ball between their beards. I swear to God. <laughs> so, um, when the black kids were playing sometimes and it was just a neutral day in the yard, no gang affiliation, just groups of guys that some days just happen to be out in the yard on a Sunday or whatever. And I would always go over and be like, yo, let me play. And then after I played one or two times, I was always picked. Like, you know, whenever they had to pick guys to play, it happened to be a neutral day and I was by the bed. Like, yo, you know, uh, whatever nickname they had me at the time. But yo, you want to play? I mean, I started, I was a really good little point guard and I could dish the ball off between my legs. I mean, I'm just grew up playing games. I grew up in Philly. So, um, same thing with play football. Um, but me and G, me and G got really tight. And so did me and Tony, like, and Tony was a black kid. And G was a black kid from Chicago. Tony was like from the West Coast, but was locked up in Chicago with us. And um, just kids that I would talk to every day. There were just kids like I was, 16, 17, 18 year old kids in there. So there was no gang war going on. I'm gonna stress that again. So there's a lot of communication between everybody. It was cool. Sure. Um, there was just a gang and race war a, a year earlier, which had the prison like on a year long lockdown. So everyone's kind of like, let's be cool right now. And, uh, and so I got there to, to, a good time. Um, when at one time, OJ Simpson, uh, not OJ Simpson, sorry. Uh, Michael Jordan's dad gets killed. Um, if anyone remembers this, but so I was in prison when that happened. And when Michael Jordan's dad got killed, 
all the black Muslims, like just all, because it's again, it's Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. So there's Michael Jordan. Right. Now they're talking about they love, they love Michael Jordan. And now his dad's been killed, or they couldn't find his dad, and they were like, it's neo Nazis. I mean, people were screaming it was white people because Jordan's too popular. Like they're like, white people killed his dad. And and I remember them all, yeah, I'm like, man, get out of here. <laughs> and uh, when they finally caught who did it, it was just two black kids who were trying to carjack his dad for his car. They didn't know it was Michael Jordan's dad. Hmm. And I said uh, to in front of all my friend, in front of all my Aryan friends, because I said this word all the time and didn't care about it. I was, I said, um, I said the N word, but I said typical N word stuff, right, like that. Right. And I just, you know, Russ, my gosh, probably laughed. I, I, I know the G was sitting in there, but I mean, we all talked like that all the time. It isn't, you know. So I didn't think much of it. But later on, me and G were playing uh, spades. And uh, oh, I was trying to cheat. I was giving the, the sign to come back in hearts or something stupid, you know, like we had little hand signs to give each other to cheat. And uh, we always cheated together. We always won a lot of money. So anyway, I remember I was doing this thing to him like to cheat, to come back in hearts and he wouldn't come back, right? And I knew he had hearts in his hand or whatever, whatever suit it was I wanted him to come back in. He was purposely not coming back in that suit and basically made us lose the game. And uh, later on I was like, dude, what, what up? I know you had low hearts, whatever. I'm yelling, I'm like, what's up, G? And he goes, guess it's just typical. And he said the N word. He goes, I guess it's just typical N word stuff, huh? And I wow. never forget, man. My stomach flipped into my chest. My, you know, my heart flipped into my stomach, man. I was just like, oh. And from like that day on, man. I, even as a neo-Nazi, because I still stayed being neo-Nazi a probably year after that little moment. I always thought about how to say that, if I should say that word. And I actually like eliminated the word from my vocabulary. And to this day, it's completely eliminated. And my family, it's eliminated. It's not, don't get me wrong, I'm a huge hip hop guy. I love, Mm. I love Meek Mill. I love Drake. I love, you know, YG. I'm like a huge, actually, hip hop guy. So to say that I don't like the N word when you're trying to sing along with a Meek Mill song, (laughs) so I learned and I trained myself to say um, like a nickel. Or ninja, so I could always stay with the words with the song. So I'm like well, a ninja instead of the, the N word. So I trained myself, <laughs> man, it. and it's been like that for 25 years. So wow. it's not like the, the N word and judging someone off that. It, it just doesn't come out of my vocabulary anymore. So um, that was one of the moments in prison where I was like, oh man, that hurts. And then I had my daughter. She was born while I was in prison. I had a, a, a daughter, and uh, I had about six months time left on my time, and she was born and. Uh, I could. I was gonna run up and tell my biker friends like, "Yo, I have my kid," but they're bikers and they're Neanderthals and they're funny and and I, I I just wasn't in the mood to hear them go. Oh, now your girl's gonna lose that baby weight. You're gonna be banging five. I mean, that stuff they would say because we were in our clique and our crew, you know. Right. And I walked on to myself because I still hung out with my Aryans every day. Don't anyone or the bikers. I hung out with them every day. I showered. We did everything together. It's the way you do shit stuff in prison is you have your click and you do everything with them but sometimes you can go play ball sometimes you can run off and go run on the track or whatever you know and it's just the way it goes in there um well when i got on that cell block and i wanted to tell them guys like yo i have my kid i just didn't want to hear anything negative like that or even trying to be funny so i seen g and um uh, g and jello and they were walking to in the g cell and I ran over and I was like, yo, and I play football and basketball with them guys. I'm, again, uh, really, those two are probably two of the kids I was closest with in there uh, at being my age. And they were Chicago black kids and I was a white. And, you know, we just kind of got along. Uh, and so I ran over to them and I was like, yo, I, I have my kid. Because they knew, because from me playing football, I'd always talk about, I was about to have a kid. I was about to have a kid. You know, I was a young 17-year-old inmate who's about to have a baby. So I'll tell her, oh, I'm about to have a kid. So they knew I was about to have a kid. And uh, I ran over to that man, and I was like, yo, I had my kid. And both of them were like, that's what's up, dude. Mm-hmm. That's what's up. You know? Like, they legitimately cared. You know? And as I would have done for them, because sure. I heard them talk about that stuff. So that was a very strong moment in my life that really came back. Last moment I would like to tell everyone, because I have to give credit where credit's doing all this. Please. When you go back to um, my county jail days, so when I got put in the county jail, they had told me, um, because of my age, 
and they have found out that I escaped from a mental hospital. A whole nother story I don't want to get into because it's another half hour. But I escaped from a mental hospital. No bullshit. So they found out about that when I was in the county jail. And so they put me in this supermax part of the, the jail. And it's not, I wasn't the toughest guy. So they basically put me in the hole, what they call the hole. But they put me there for my own protection because I was a young neo-Nazi in this big county jail. And, uh, you know, just a suicide risk. Uh, a, a homicidal suicidal maniac that they should have put me in there and they did and so I was in there for about four or five months fighting my trial wow uh, they had no law yet saying that inmates need to be out 24 and 23 and one like they didn't have a law yet and so I'm just stressing that because they never let us out of our cells except for if six, they let you have to go shower once a week and get on the phone once a week you never watched TV. You never did that. You weren't allowed to have nothing in your cell because it was suicide watch cells. Mm -hmm. So no TV in your cell. No nothing, man. And you weren't allowed to get commentary because they were afraid you were going to kill yourself with cookies or something. I don't know, <laughs> but they weren't allowed to have commentary because it's a segregated hole. So I don't know that. I'm in there for five months, man, living with – just living off their meals, which was horrible and starving all the time. And I deserved it. I'm sure people on your show listen and be like, yeah, you kidnapped somebody. You freaking deserve that, right? Right. Um, I, I get it. I get it. Um, but I started to read a lot of religious books. I read the whole Book of Mormons in mm -hmm. there, cover to cover. It is what it is. Hey. It's the Book of Mormons. Hey. Yeah, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. I read parts of the Quran, the English translation versions we had. And then I started reading the Bible again. And now again, I kind of grew up with the Bible. And, um, but I've always had someone teaching it to me. So here's what I used to do. You'll get a kick out of this. Yeah. I would hold the Bible shut. And I'd be like, all right, God, if you're real, I want you to kill all the guards. If you're real, you know, like, I'm nuts, guys. I'm nuts. I'm like, if you're real, I want you to kill all the guards, pop my door, and knock down this wall, and let me go home. You're going to do it. Ready? And three, two, one. Oh, come on, God. You're so fake. And then I would throw the Bible down on my bed. And whatever page it opened to, that's what I'm going to read for tonight. So... I get to read into this part in the Bible. I've been in there about four months in this in this hole. So it's probably about four months, yeah. I am start reading the Bible where it talks about John the Baptist starts to, to fast. He, he's fasting uh, so that Jesus and God will recognize him. And he's in prison. So I'm like, oh, what a great story. Oh, it's just like me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. I'm going to fast. I'm not going to eat so God will kill the guards, knock down the door, knock down the wall, and pop my door. Like I'm like, I'm going to fast and God's going to do that. Like, I'm, again, I'm nuts. Um, so I start fasting. And it says in the book, you says you cannot brag or boast that you're fasting for God because then you've already received your reward. You're just like the asshole praying on the street corner. Like, your reward is that everyone sees that you're so godly, right? When it's supposed to be private sure. between you and God, right? So don't go around telling everyone, yo, I'm fasting because God is my boy. That's what's up. You know, like, you can't do that. So when I start not eating... They think that my, my case is a very high-profile case because of the kidnapping, the TV show, the neo-Nazi stuff. I mean, it was crazy. Um, gun running. There was all types of stuff going on. So my case is always in the news, blah, blah, blah. These guys keep coming to me, and they start trying to feed me my food, and they would slide it through the food tray, and I would push the food back out every time during my fasting because if the food would have came in there, I would have ate it, man. I was so hungry. Wow. So I just kept pushing the food back out. And then they would ask me, are you refusing to eat? And I say, yeah. And they say, why? I can't tell you. <laughs> but be prepared. There's some shit going down on Monday and I'm getting out of here, right? You know what I mean? That's the way I'm thinking. Like, I right, can't right. tell you why, but I'm fucking out of here, dog. <laughs> and so uh, three days goes by and I'm starving. And the warden comes into this county jail. He's like the lieutenant of the police there, but he runs to prison. Pulls me out of my cell on a Sunday. And, and, I, and I already did my three days. It's my third day of my fast, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I'm going to eat Monday. So he comes in my cell and pulls me out and says, hey, Mr. Mink, are you trying to kill yourself? And I'm like, no. He's like, are you on a hunger strike? I'm like, no. And he's like, well, why are you not eating? And I'm like, I don't know. Hmm. And he says, well, how about this? If you eat tomorrow, I'll come get you and I'm going to put you in general population. I don't think you, I think you could do just fine over there. There's a bunch of other kids over there too in the, in the, in the adult part. So we're going to get you out of the cell box. I hadn't done nothing to be in that hole. You know, they just had me in there for segregation reasons. So he says, right, I'm going to let you out tomorrow if you eat. And I'd already planned on eating, but I made it seem like for him, I was like, for you, Warden, definitely, definitely <laughs> eat tomorrow, right? And I ate, I ate and, uh, 
He came and got me on Monday morning. He said, let's go, pack up your stuff. And he took me out and there was a moment that no one, no atheist, no agnostic, no nobody can take away from me is there was a moment where God said to me, and it wasn't like a major speaking voice, it was something that came right into my body and it just said, I'm not gonna give you what you want. I'll give you what you need. And that is to get you out of this fucking cell block. Because I started talking to myself. I mean, when you're in there by yourself, you will lose your mind. Solitary confinement is not safe or good for a human being. Right. I had started talking to myself all the time. I, 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 um, I would catch myself having conversations out loud. It was really <laughs> creepy and scary in there. That's extraordinary. And so I remember this moment, and I'm not insane, where there was this moment where it was just like, because if God gave me what I wanted, we're all in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. But he gave me what I needed. And that was yeah. and what's so crazy is two days later, I meet G, who's one of the main people that starts to change me. Then I met this other dude named Abel, this black dude in that county jail. Abel, who loved the story of Cain and Abel about how crack cocaine took Abel down and he was the greatest dude. Like I, it was like after that moment, people just kept getting put in my life. Because people always say, like, what started your change? And I got to give it to God. He consistently kept putting people in my life to prove me wrong every time. And it was him. It was God. It was like I would turn around and boom, another person would be in my life to be like, "Who the fuck are you to judge, Frank? That's Who are you to judge?" That's extraordinary, yeah. Frank. Um, it'd be a sin to have you on and not talk about American History X a little bit, right? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, in your book, Autobiography of a Recovering Skinhead. Um, to quote you directly, um, you state that American History X isn't my story. It's every skinhead's story to some extent. It was every other kid who ever got sucked up into the white supremacy movement, end quote. So, yeah. yes, sir. So I'd like to ask you point blank, um, to what extent, if any, the movie is based on your life specifically? You know, so, you know, we'll never get to the bottom of it, <laughs> you know, um, and, and it's fine. You know, it, it, it it's God's movie. That movie's done really well for, it, it's helped a lot of people, actually. So I, I'll give them that. But look. There was only two neo Nazis out, former neo Nazis out in the early in the early nineties, telling their stories. Me and a guy named T.J. Lydon. Now they approached T.J. and um, and if, if I recall, they did approach me, but I was getting approached all the time at the time for movies, right? And I was actually in the works with a movie with people that were working for DreamWorks at the time, hmm. who came to me and said they wanted to make this movie. Just to tell you that I'm not the one who started telling people American Shrek was my story. The first people that ever told me, tell me that that was my story was the people from the DreamWorks people. Were like, yo, the, you know that Miramax or Lionsgate, I think it was, they're like, you know they're making your story, right? And I was like, what? Because uh, first they thought that I sold my story behind their back because we were kind of working on a deal thing. Oh, I see. And I'm like, no. And, um, and then as it came out, like people were just like, saying or like yeah they're they're using like kind of you and tj's story in this movie and tj was from venice from that area so he kind of fits a little bit of that mold of the and then i mean th so there's only two other neo-nazis out telling their stories at the time what good writers don't do research and there is still to this day there's hundreds of formers out to telling their story now and it's great and it's that's what we need for everyone we have kind of the antibodies in us to hate mm. but what yeah, you know, we really do. We have the well antibodies. Said. And so, um, and I'll tell you that all of them associate that movie to me because there's not one other neo-Nazi that ever been like, yo, I was a baller and I went to prison and I was a baller in prison. Like, who, there was just too many coincidences. And even when the movie came out, um, Good Morning America, um, The Today Show, uh, um, uh, current affair, they all were getting, they're like, hey, why don't you promote your movie? They heard, we heard they're finally making a movie about your life. And I'm like, it's not mine, like, it's not me. They made it on their own, it's their own. <laughs> and then when it came out, I was just like, all right, because I, I used to always talk about curb stomping in my old talks when I first, when I used to go around and talk, everything. I used to talk about curb stomping. I said that I wish more teachers would take uh, a, a point in my life. And uh, and I talked about playing the basketball in prison and becoming friends with a kid in the jail hall, except for they made, there was just too many little coincidences, you know what right. I mean? That, so I, I, I'm not calling them that, and, and just so you know, the writer of, of American History X also wrote Blow, which is also a half ripped off life, true life story. Hmm. So, you know, so I think the guy's just a really good researcher and he just doesn't want to, 
it's fine. It, it, you know, the guy did a great job in writing a movie, and either him or his one of his rewriters, someone I have a, the, I, I just know that they have my story. You know, I just know it, and, and it's fine. It, it's done its own thing, and I and I, I, I don't mind it. It's. I'll tell you what, it's been crazy. Like after my book came out, when there's like five or six options to make it into a movie, everyone's like, we can't because of American History X. And I was like, <laughs> and, 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 and it's so funny because I'm like, it's okay. It's, it, it'll all happen in God's time. I don't need a movie made about my life. My, my life is not about be having a movie made about me. Right? Sure. Even the life I still live today, which is pretty wild. I mean, so that's what I could tell you about American History X. But it, it, is, it has done its job. It, it, there's so many people that do get a hold of me because of that movie. And again, it's not because I run around telling everyone. I, 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 and you'll never see me write, I'm the guy that made American History X about. Like, I just don't say that. But people always you know, attribute it to <laughs> it, me. I just, just let it go. You know, it's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's, I don't care. It's kind of funny. It, ma it made me uh, researching for this interview, Frank, difficult. Because the whole time I was researching, I was like, well, was he the damn inspiration or not? <laughs> because some sources were saying you were. Some, you know, it was kind of loose. Um, but uh, no, and, and there are, and I do believe that Tony K, the director, yes, had known. So I think he had said something about me one time. So it's it's an amazing movie. Edward Norton is one of my all time favorite actors, and performance was extraordinary. Um, Absolutely, yes, sir. Uh, all right, Frank, I just have a, a couple questions left. I'll be brisk in, in respect to your time, sir. Let's yeah, th it. thanks, man. So obviously, you've been interviewed by people um, much more, you know intelligent and better looking than me, right? <laughs> CNN, NPR, um, among others. I I'm curious, has there been a question that hasn't been asked of you that you wish someone would ask? Oh, uh, man, oof. Um, you know, I guess, I guess, like, what is the a daily, I guess people just don't ever say, like, what's your daily life like to, if you're not a neo-Nazi and you're like, I guess, and not that it's so fascinating, but, um, like, because up in, just because I got the neo-Nazis, I wasn't fine. You know, I had other issues. There obviously is. And I think a lot of times, I think, I wish people more talk about, like, the the depression mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, the, the mental illness. There's a mental illness that's informed, that is formed in neo-Nazism and, and hate. And um, so, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Uh, and I'll ask a question of myself that I like to answer, and that is, you know, my belief in God is, is really important to me, and and I don't have any set religion, right? but I have a, a constant contact with a higher power, I believe, and and I and I keep that with me, and, and I know that my job on this planet today uh, is to be of maximum service to every human being I come into contact with, to live an altruistic lifestyle. Mm. Now I I do happen to read. Uh, more in the Torah is probably where I go for my religiously guiding. I uh, usually will read the Torah, but other than that, like the, the 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 way I live my life today is so amazingly beautiful and happy. And I don't have every. I mean, I just went through a, a brutal divorce, but then I I got reconnected with with a higher power. It, it took me a dozen steps to get to him, but I got there. And um, just to know that. If my life is just to be of service to others, there there's a happiness and joy that, that God will give to you because to me, God is God is love. That's all it is. God is love. And then affection is us as humans trying to show the same feeling that God gives us to the world. So the more affectionate you are, the more caring you are, is because you have a really good connection with the God who's telling you that the world is not about you. Mm -hmm. I think one of the greatest things, the good... The, the bad the bad thing is it's not all about me the great thing is it's not all about me <laughs> yeah, right? it's, it's just amazing um, and so to live that lifestyle has um, has really given me the most truest purpose and that's why I stand up for Breonna Taylor mm -hmm. that's why I stand up for Black Lives Matter because it's standing up for somebody else you know it's not standing up for, for me to get anything out of it it's just I know that God's children are being systematically abused and how can I not stand up? I mean, I just testified in front of Congress that I know there's neo-Nazi cops and there's other right-wing extremist cops that they should not be able to have the power to pull people over and search their cars. It's really scary for black people. And so I I've taken that charge on because I believe that God has given me that job. I, what better person than a former neo-Nazi to tell you that like, 
it's really bad if there's people that used to believe what I believe that are cops. Right. And there's a lot. Of them. And, and so and we need to look at that and we need to have a real conversation about that. So and if that's my purpose on this planet is to spread that message and to keep that message going that Black Lives Matter and that whole movement is about police brutality, not rioting, not socialism. None of, we, we have to stick to the core message, and it's about police brutality, especially on our black and brown brothers and sisters, which is systematically set up to let it happen. And we can change this. We can fix this. The Constitution and the, the Bill of Rights allows for us to fix it. We just fixed this country in one way. We got together as a group in humanity, and we voted out a freaking madman. We did that together. Now we can fix this. We can fix police brutality. We can fix police accountability. We can go and say, no more searching our car civil servants. It should not even be a goal in their mind anymore because that goal is to break the Fourth Amendment and it's breaking everything in that training. They keep saying, let's go back to the training. It's this one little thing. I'm telling you, if we fix this, it'll fix policing. Beautiful. Thank you, Frank. No, well said, sir. Um... I have just uh, two questions left. I'll be extremely sure. brief. Yes, sir. Uh, if you weren't a speaker, author, activist, um, what do you think you'd be in life, sir? Oh, a hockey coach all day long. Right on. I, I, co- I coached the, I, you know, I, I coached the 12 national championships. I did know 12 that. 12 nationals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, 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 whatever I put my mind to and God allows me to do, man, I, I could do it really good. I mean, if it's running a street gang to mm. running a hockey team. It's the same thing. Who, who, you get to find the right people to stay home and protect the safe house. And you got to pick the right guys to go out and flip your thing or go rec- recruit or go be your – and you set it up just the same way. Mm-hmm. And I set up a hockey team the same way, you know. It all revolves around the goalie. And, <laughs> uh, so uh, anyway, I, that's, I would 100% be a hockey coach full out. I love it. Frank Mink, my friend, how can people find out about you, sir? Man, just find me on Twitter, uh, Frank Mink, and Mink's M-E-E-I-N-K, but just find me on Twitter, Frank Mink. If any questions, I, I, nothing's off the table. If I can help in any way, be of service to a person who is helping. That's our job. My job is to be of service, and my past is the greatest asset that I have to give away as gold to this to that service. That's all. Excellent, excellent, excellent. You're a good man, Frank Mink. I appreciate the time, sir, and uh, this, was, this was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.